So. Wenn der Ton geht, eins, zwei, drei, schönen guten Abend. Schönen guten Abend zu einem ganz besonderen Vortrag im Rahmen der Wiener Festwochen und des Programms Into the City 2017. Ich begrüße ganz herzlich Slavoj Žižek. Sie haben ihn schon äh, begrüßt. Ich begrüße den Direktor der AK Wien, bei dem ich mich auch für die Kooperation ganz herzlich bedanke. Christoph Klein, schön, dass Sie hier sind. Und ich möchte mich auch ganz herzlich bedanken beim Organisationsteam rund um Birgit Meißel von der AK Wien, die uns diesen, diese Räume zur Verfügung gestellt hat und auch die Übertragung ins Akzent rüber. Das Theater drüben ist voll und auch Räume dazwischen sind mit Publikum gefüllt. Der exklusive Vortrag, und natürlich möchte ich auch Rudolf Scholten, den Festwochenpräsidenten, begrüßen und seine Frau, ähm, Thomas Zierhofer, weiß ich nicht, ob er hier ist. Robert Faller ist hier, einer der Buchautoren, gemeinsam mit Slavoj Žižek. Dieser exklusive Vortrag von Slavoj Žižek, The College of Hopelessness, ist Teil unseres Festwochenprojekts NSK State Venice Pavilion in Vienna. Dieses Projekt des Künstlerkollektivs Irwin findet ähm, also gleichzeitig in Venedig und Wien statt, ist ein Pavillon, der abseits der Biennale und hier bei den Festwochen das Nationalstaatenmodell kritisiert. Ein Thema, das auch bei Slavoj Žižek immer wieder eine Rolle spielt. Teil des Pavillons in Wien sowie in Venedig, in der Kaiserstraße 76 hier, ist das NSK-Passamt. Das, das sind begehrte NSK-Pässe, die es seit 1992 als Projektteil dieses fiktiven NSK-Staates gibt. Ähm, so wie in Venedig werden auch in Wien ähm, Flüchtlinge, elf junge Flüchtlinge, diese Pässe ausgeben, die auch ähm, Spaß dabei haben, dieses ähm, hierarchische Verhältnis einmal umzudrehen. Und ähm, betreut und, und kooperiert ähm, ist dieses Modell mit dem Verein Einander, die auch hier sind, und auch, ich glaube, ein oder zwei Flüchtlinge sind hier. Äh, Dankeschön für diese Zusammenarbeit und Kooperation. Informationen zu, zu allen Projekten finden Sie natürlich im Abendprogramm, das hier aufliegt. Wichtiger Teil unserer Kooperation mit der Arbeiterkammer ist äh, das exklusive Angebot, das muss ich sagen, des Buches, das Sie draußen sehen, The Final Countdown. Dieses Buch ist für dieses zweiteilige Projekt ähm, exklusiv entstanden unter Mitarbeit und äh, unter Mitarbeit von äh, Slavoj Žižek und Jela Grecic ähm, mit prominenten Autoren. Einer davon ist hier, Robert Pfaller, auch herzlich willkommen. Ein Buch, das wir bewusst zu einem Preis von 10 Euro anbieten, stark limitiert, also greifen Sie zu, es gibt es bei den Festwochen und noch bis Ende Juli in Venedig am Rande der Biennale, kann man sagen. Slavo Žižek ist auch so freundlich, nachher Bücher zu signieren auf der Bühne, werden wir zeitmäßig ein bisschen beschränken. Es sind viele Fragen gekommen per E-Mail. Ich werde die versuchen, dann anschließend ein wenig zusammenzufassen. Und ja, mir bleibt jetzt nur mehr Zeit, Ihnen einen wunderschönen, aufregenden, spannenden Abend zu wünschen. Und welcome, Slavoj Žižek. Thank you for coming. Welcome at the Vienna Festival. Vielen Dank. Ich danke Ihnen und ich möchte gern auf Deutsch sprechen. Leider geht das nicht. Aber dennoch, wenn Sie Fragen auf Deutsch stellen, kann ich direkt antworten. Äh, obwohl, sorry, I have to go to English. I spoke with Wolfgang before and he told me, no, no, only he will ask me questions. 
So I like this step from bürgerlich liberalen Demokratie to wirklichen Volksdemokratie, where the leader knows best what is good for the people and he will speak for you. you know? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I will please have a little bit of patience because I will not do, I'm getting tired of them, my usual jokes. I will really try to cover the topic. So, let me begin with a wonderful quote from George Orwell. I quoted it often in my work, where he describes the typical attitude of academic radical leftists. The text was written in 1937, quote, We all rail against class distinctions, but very few people seriously want to abolish them. Here you come upon the important fact that every revolutionary opinion draws part of its strength from a secret conviction that nothing can really be changed. End of quote. Orwell's point is that Many radicals invoke the need for revolutionary change as a kind of superstitious token that should achieve the exact opposite, prevent the change from really taking place. Again, like today's academic leftists who criticize capitalist cultural imperialism, but are in reality horrified at the idea that his or her field of study would really break down. And as I mentioned in Venedig, in Venice, a week ago, I think that big biennales like Venedig Biennale are a model of this. Did you notice how all these big biennale, I don't know, Castle, Venedig, their ideology is more and more uh, the ideological presentation of biennales, that of radical leftist self-criticism. We are all penetrated by capital. We know, we know we are just a tool for capitalist investment. We should criticize ourselves. But you know, you know the famous quote for, from your greatest compatriot here, Sigmund Freud. He quotes that famous Jewish jokes of two Jews used to lie to each other so that the way to really lie is to tell the truth because you are expected to lie and the other, so one Jew says to the other, why are you telling me that you are going to Elvov when you are really going to Elvov, I know. So again, my answer to that self-critical attitude is why are you saying that you are just uh, an instrument in the reproduction of cultural capital when you are really just an instrument in the reproduction of, of, uh, of cultural capital. So, uh, how then to break this circle? It is only when we despair at, and don't know anymore what to do that change can be enacted. We have to go through some kind of zero point of hopelessness. The lesson of the 20th century communism is that we have to gather the strength to fully assume this hopelessness. Giorgio Agamben said in an interview that thought, das Denken, is the courage of hopelessness. An insight, again, which is especially pertinent for our historical moment when even the most pessimist diagnostics as a rule finishes with an uplifting hint at some version, version of the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. The true courage is not to imagine an alternative, but to accept the consequences of the fact that there is today no clearly discernible alternative. The dream of an alternative is a clear sign of theoretical cowardice. It functions as a fetish which prevents us from thinking to the end, the deadlock of our predicament. In short, the true courage is to admit that the light at the end of the tunnel is most likely the headlight of another train approaching us from the opposite direction. This train approaching us from the opposite direction, assumed lately many forms. In the last year or so, troubles in our global capitalist paradise exploded at four levels. The renewed 
so-called fundamentalist terrorist threat, the, our declaration of war against ISIS, Boko Haram, and so on, geopolitical tensions between and within non-European new powers, China, especially Russia, the flow of refugees crossing, crossing the wall that separates us from them, and so on, and so on. And I would like to begin with this problem, which now appears to be temporarily resolved, but which I think will explode again, the so-called, I even don't like the name, problem of refugees. My God, I was often accused of playing some kind of a racist, Eurocentrist game here, like some journal leftist uh, author even accused me of that I'm already waiting in line to join Pegida or whatever. No, on the contrary, I think we should change the field radically. We should move away from this uh, humanitarian approach. Of course, we should do what we can, all we can, to help the refugees. But the problem is not a humanitarian one. It's ridiculous to claim that if we Europeans open up our heart again, then what? All the poor people will come here and what? Isn't it much more crucial to begin thinking now? It's not an improper moment now and acting in view of this thinking about but what caused the refugees? What are we, Europe also? doing wrong, our economic uh, neocolonialism, buying the best fertile land in Africa, the crazy geopolitics of the big powers. Are we aware that without American, Russian, Saudi Arabia, and so on intervention, there would have been no refugees from Syria, from, from Iraq, and so on, and so on? We have to change these coordinates. It's, I think that precisely this fascination with refugee suffering is the ultimate fetish because it changes a mega serious political problem into a humanitarian concern. And sentimental liberals always like this, to, to change again, to avoid critical political analysis and begin to talk, you know, all this rubbish, like, are our hearts open enough? No, we don't need open hearts. We need precise political action to break this cycle of global geopolitics, which creates and will continue to create refugees. Uh, so, what should be our theoretical starting point? I would like to begin with a reference to someone who is close to me. He is even not a leftist Marxist, more a Zionist liberal, Jean-Claude Milner. But in an interesting way, he reactivated the old infamous, for some people, difference between human rights and citizens' rights. Jean-Claude Milner, rejects the Marxist critical notion of human rights as the rights of the egotist members of the bourgeois civil society. For Milner, citizen is the member of a community sharing its specific culture, while a human being is what remains of a citizen when he or she is deprived of his or her citizenship. Human rights are natural, only in this sense of the externality to a particular culture. They have nothing to do with some eternal nature, since they apply to what remains of a citizen after he or she is subtracted from a specific police community. In this sense, the nature of human rights, human rights as natural means precisely rights which should apply to every human being, reduced to the zero level of what are we basically? Bodies, animals which speak. A nice, although a little bit too long, maybe quote from Milner. One gains a glimpse into the real of the rights of the body in examining what goes on when they are denied to individuals. Every day brings us a new example. I do not have to think about bombs and poisonous gases. I think about Calais, 
you know, the camp which is now dismantled there in France. Those who are assembled there from the year 2000 are not guilty of anything. They are not accused of anything. They do not infringe upon any part of the law. They are simply there and they leave. The proof that they leave is that sometimes they die. Nobody knows what languages they are speaking, and anyway, one doesn't listen to them. One only knows that they speak. They are therefore reduced to the status of speaking bodies. By the settlement to which they are submitted, they literally render visible in a negative way the real of the rights of men or women. These rights are distinguished from the rights of a citizen since refugees are precisely not the citizens of Calais and mostly also do not want to become that. End of quote. Milner insists on the vulgar materiality of these rights. They are more basic than the rights to reunion, free speech, opinion, and so on. Before that comes the material base of a body, water, food, hygiene, minimal space of privacy. If individuals are deprived of this, their higher human rights disappear. Human rights are first such basic material rights, toilets, kitchen, health care, and so on. Rights begin even with the space for secretion, toilets. Insofar as human rights were first proclaimed by the French Revolution, one should note the irony of the fact that Calais is a French city. Of course, these rights are not natural in the sense of eternity. They are always redefined by a specific historical context. Uh, we can say, but I already find this problematic, that people, refugees, who are covered by these rights, who are reduced to speaking bodies, are proletarians in the sense of being deprived of citizenship. But I find this fashionable designation problematic. Now comes the polemical aspect. Some of my friends claim refugees are the new proletariat. I find this attitude extremely cynical and mystifying. Why? One of my friends, I will not embarrass him and uh, name him, even developed this theory. We in Europe have good revolutionary critical theory. But, and you know, this is the problem of Marxism from the beginning, but we don't have a revolutionary subject who will do this. So now we have a unique chance to outsource, as it were, the revolutionary subject. Maybe the refugees will be our proletariat. It doesn't work. It's too optimistic, this. Not because, let me emphasize immediately, refugees are too stupid or whatever. But for Marx, proletariat means something very precise. Workers who generate wealth, but are deprived of the substance of their being, exploited, and so on and so on. The irony is that, as far as I can see, most, or if not most, at least many, among the refugees would precisely like to become proletarians in this sense. The irony is that, uh, and this is what complicates everything, the irony is that, uh, the traditional working class, let's say you're a traditional worker, you are okay, alienated in the Marxist sense, blah, blah, but you have a permanent job where you are permanently exploited and so on, but you survive and so on. This is almost a privileged position today. We have permanently unemployed, we have refugees, we have precarious workers and so on, who I'm tempted to say strive all the time to become good old-fashioned exploited proletarians in this sense. You know, uh, that's the problem with Marxism today. It is in a way Marxist analysis of capitalism, it, it is more true than ever. The Marxist uh, description of the capitalist dynamics, the famous lines in Capita uh, Communist Manifesto and so on, they reach today a level that Marx couldn't even have imagined. You know, when Marx says uh, everything's solid, 
melt and uh, incredible dynamics, all natural relations dissolve. Could he even have imagined, for example, the consequences at the level of sexuality with transgenderism and so on and so on? So it's more radical than Marx imagined, but at the same time, and that's the nice Hegelian lesson, precisely when some concept is fully realized, directly seems to describe reality, a gap appears. The victory is the moment of defeat. So to, if I try to describe in the best possible way where Marx stands today, I am tempted to quote one of my favorite Rabinovich Radio Erevan jokes from ex-Soviet Union. You know, Radio Erevan was a legendary. There is a real Radio Erevan, but I'm talking about legend. A radio station to which listeners were allowed to, they were allowed to call it to ask questions, and the answer of Radio Erevan was always, in principle, yes, it's true, but. So one of these famous questions to Radio Erevan is, is it true that the Jew Rabinovich, this is the legendary, legendary figure of Soviet jokes, that the Jew Rabinovich won a new car at a state lottery? Radio Erevan answers, yes, in principle it's true, but it wasn't a new car, but an old bicycle, and he didn't win it, it was stolen from him. <laughs> So it was something similar that we have to say concerning, is it true that proletarians are today a threat to existing system, blah, blah, blah. Yes, in principle it's true, but <laughs> the, the true proletarians are not proletarians at all, and so on and so on. Now I want to do another complication here, which I also think Marx didn't take fully into account. What, and many of my friends hate even the very term, ways of life. That's the big problem with refugees. Not their problem, our problem. In no way do I blame them or even hail them for inferior. Listen, we are not only citizens or humans in this abstract sense. All of us, at least initially, belongs to a certain community with a specific way of life. And, of course, the problem with refugees and our problem is that, this, that again, refugees don't come as Cartesian subjects. Oh, hi, I'm just, a, I am just a speaking body and nothing more. No. They come... Uh, with the burden of a specific way of life. How to combine these specific ways of life is a problem. Why? And again, I know I'm here treading dangerous waters, because for some of my leftist friends, the very term of way of life is, aha, are you joining Le Pen or Pegida or what? Uh, uh, except if we speak about marginal way of life, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is that my first correction of the standard view, a way of life is not just what we call about civilization, customs, and so on, but a civilization, customs, which, if you permit me here, a reference to theories of Jacques Lacan, psychoanalytic theories, which signal how you deal with what Lacan calls jouissance, excessive enjoyment, in, which doesn't mean kind of a half-traumatic, uh, like sexual madness enjoyment, but it means not direct pleasure, but the enjoyment, maybe I can put it in this way, the enjoyment of organizing pleasure. For example, what is a way of life of a certain community? Typically, this is very evil what I will say, when I debate with my multiculturalist friends, they said each group that comes to Europe should be allowed to maintain their way of life. Okay, no problem. But then I asked them, okay, what do you mean by way of life? 
And then they start to enumerate their food, their dances, their songs, blah, blah, whatever you want. But all of them, as far as I knew, then stop at a certain level. They never add their sexual customs and their relations of hierarchy. But they are at the very core of a way of life. I remember from my own miserable country, south from here, there was, I've written often about it, there was a big conflict, big, not too big, nobody really cared, but okay, polemics in Slovenia, some 15, 20 years ago, I think, uh, Roma, old-fashioned wrong term, gypsy, a Roma girl escaped her home because her father, when she was 12, in an arranged marriage, wanted to force her to marry a colleague of him. And he took refuge with the police, and what to do then? Of course, all the feminists exploded. We should protect the girls' rights, and so on and so on. I noticed with real vicious spirit that the same feminists otherwise were all against Eurocentrism for the protection of different ways of life, multiculturalism. But then one key figure of Slovene Roma community said something which was deeply true. He said, but wait a minute, arranged marriages are the key component of our way of life. You take this away from us in two, three generations, the latest, we will become, you know, the usual gypsies. Maybe we will have our spicy food, our music, and so on. We will disappear. So where do you stop here? And I am not to avoid a misunderstanding. In no way am I claiming, yes, they are barbarian, we should impose of them our way of life. I'm just, or another aspect, uh, hierarchy, social hierarchy. For example, in India, caste system, I'm sorry to tell you this, is their way of life. And consequent post-colonial theorists there accept it. For example, when I was in India, I asked them, what are you doing to abolish castes? And they said, who are you to preach us to this? Western, Western uh, Democrat, racist, neocolonialist, culturalist, who wants to ruin our traditional way of life. Again, in a way, they were right. You know, this is, I think, an impossible dream that you think you can bring together what we in Europe, and I'm not saying we are right, I'm just describing, that we in Europe uh, uh, have certain fights for, you know, gay struggle, abortion, femininity, human rights, and so on. And uh, the, the, the problem is no longer just theoretical when, and at the same time, we want to be tolerant, and so on. Where does tolerance end? And I claim there is no simple solution here. Multiculturalists like to say we should be all one big family, tolerant towards each other, and so on and so on. I am opposed to this formula, but to avoid a misunderstanding. Not because I think our universality is the right one, and we can impose our universality onto others. I see a totally different way out. As I immediately discovered in India, there is no neutral way of life. What those, and this is typical, although they present themselves as leftists, what Indian uh, post-colonial cultural studies people present as, as their way of life has an extremely strong class dimension. And there is a wide resistance in India, which is totally obfuscated by this topic of some way of life, cultural identity. You know that there is, for example, the Naxalit, a Maoist rebellion, almost one million armed men fighting in what remains of the jungle. You don't read about this. What about, uh, I uh, encountered them, I immediately established contact in India. The so-called untouchables, and the lowest among them, those who are uh, cleaning dry toilets, they provide to me the best definition of what is a proletarian. I ask them, what is your program? 
They told me our program is not to be ourselves, what we are. They totally rejected all this, you know. We are poor, but isn't it something wonderful in our way of life, in how we are? No, they don't want that. And I think that, you see, that should be our first starting point. Uh, uh, All these communities of refugees and so on and so on don't buy the talk of a unique, homogeneous way of life. In the same sense as we, our societies, are deeply divided by antagonisms, the visible and the less invisible antagonism. For example, so-called culture wars and so on and so on. The same, the same goes there with very interesting paradoxes that some authentic anti-Eurocentrists don't like. For example, I discovered, and I was given text which analyzed this, that in India, I'm totally for the predomination of English language. You know why? I discovered, isn't it a paradoxical nice result, that the lower you go in social ladder in India, the more they like English. You know why? Because as untouchables explained to me, their own languages are so much penetrated by social hierarchies. Like, if you are a member of different castes, you will use different expressions or how you address others. That for them, English, with its simplistic university, it's the language of equality and openness. And again, we have to accept this paradox. I have it at home. One of these uh, uh, theories of the untouchables wrote, a praise, appraisal of English language as the only means to bring social, and so on and so on. So uh, here, this is my first point. It is not that we have ways of life and then we should tolerate each other and this is the usual stupid formula. In an open society, each of us, each community can develop its way of life. But when one community oppresses the other, of course, the other society, the oppressed, can turn into fundamentalism, is thwarted, and so on and so on. No, almost I'm tempted to say the opposite. There are no authentic ways of life. All ways of life are traversed, cut with radical antagonisms. What is Indian way of life? It's one great struggle, and so on. It's the same with China. The regime tries to propose some kind of Confucian way of life, specifically Chinese. No, it's a cover-up for almost permanent civil war in India, and so on, and so on. So again, we should be very open here and never talk about another's way of life. When I come to a society, I never ask, what's your way of life in a foreign country? I ask them, what are your fights? And try to orient. So for me, universalism is not a brotherhood of ways of life. I respect you, you respect me. No, universalism is, we have a struggle here, emancipation, workers' rights, feminists, and so on. They have their struggles. Can we bring these struggles together? Now comes my paradoxical result. Uh, uh, here I praise, but in a very sad, almost cynical way, here I praise the wisdom of British imperialism. For example, Indian way of life is embodied, this traditional caste system, in one of the most horrible books that I ever read, The Loss of Manu. It's a basically systematic description of the caste system in all these tiny daily material practices. And an obscene old guy like me, I love it, you know. Because, for example, you have there, oh my God, how I love it, descriptions like if you don't want during sexual act for a man who cares about women in that book to make her pregnant, and after you pull in the last minute out the penis, in what way should you turn around and in a correct way wipe your penis or whatever and so on? It's madness. It's the madness. But what I want to say is this. Then I spoke with some Indians, good friends of mine, and then I checked it up with others. It's true. 
they gave me a wonderful explanation. They said, do you know that before British colonization in 17th century, this caste system was already disintegrating, but it got a great boost from the British occupation because the British got it in immediately. If they tried to impose their way of life, they would be breeding revolutionary proletariat, social chaos, what capitalism brings. So literally, this loss of Marcus were rediscovered, printed by the British and so on, because they got it that if the silent Indian majority is in the hands of the worst hierarchic patriarchy, it will make their rule much easier. So, you know, this is already a nice example of how it's not, as some post-colonial theorists try to convince us, uh, there are some harmonious, okay, maybe with conflicts, but well-doing, living in natural balance, holistic, you know, all that bullshit. We imperialists just come to a mountain and mine it. No, the authentic way is to ask the spirits of a mountain, can we rape you, and only then you do it, and so on. Uh, uh, no, the point, uh, uh, the point is that it's not like this, it's that paradoxically, Authentic imperialism always was, in this sense, multicultural. Especially today, I claim. Are you aware what is happening now, the significance of the last political events? How? Precisely those countries who stand economically for the most radical, open uh, global capitalism, culturally move more and more towards some kind of authoritarian ethnic stance. China. I find no contradiction in the fact that on the one hand China insists on its uh, Confucian legacy, not just Western culture. At the same time, as a very shrewd, I think, reaction to Trump's stupidities, you saw what Xi, the Chinese president, said a week ago or so. He presented himself and China as the true agent of global open market against protectionism and so on. The same with Erdogan in Turkey, the same in India with Modi and so on, uh, and so on, and so on. So again, we are encountering here real problems. That's all I'm saying. Let me take mention, I learned it from a Tibetan friend, this a wonderful terrifying example from Tibet. Uh, I am totally horrified by what, the Chinese, by what the Chinese are doing there. I'm just asking you one thing. Don't paint Tibet as some kind of holistic, harmonious uh, society which was then brutally destabilized by the Chinese intervention in 49 and especially later in 59. Look, uh, I read this again, I was told by a friend, and then I checked this up in a book which is totally pro-Tibetan. You know that in ancient Tibet, and this lasted till 59, when the Chinese intervened directly, uh, uh, because till 59, for the first 10 years of occupation, the Chinese basically left the way of life as it was there. You know, Tibet is mountains, just narrow path. So, if two persons in, walking in the opposite direction, direction meet on a path, one has to step aside. And it was strictly codified. Those who is lowest, let's say an ordinary guy meets a high priest or a feudal master, he has not only to step aside, but do a certain gesture, which is so disgusting, humiliating. Adopt uh, bow his head, but at the same time make a specific expression with his face, like look with eyes as an idiot up, and like basically you see what a disgusting idiot I am. And it's so nice, I like this always, being devil's advocate. When in the late 50s Chinese wanted to prohibit this, of course, what was the outcry? Oh, imperialist, you are meddling in our way of life, and so on and so on. Now, uh, Chinese were extremely brutal, I agree, but the situation was more complex. You know when Red Guards in the mid-60s were 
thousands of them ruining monasteries in Tibet and so on. It's nice to ask one simple question. Who were these Red Guardists? The rumor was Chinese brought them by trains, by planes and so on, hordes of wild... No, now we know the data. You know how many Red Guardists came from China to Tibet? Between 50 and 100. All those thousands of people were their own dissatisfied young people. So again, what I'm saying is that it's a wrong opposition, specific way of life versus that universal imperialism. Yes, the universality of imperialist culture is often oppressive, one-sided. But don't play particular culture as, as the good thing to resist universality. I think that the point is to show how our European universality is a false universality and true shared struggle impose another universality. Uh, another thing I want to uh, make clear here, uh, that, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, here psychoanalysis comes useful. Why is it so traumatic for people to really integrate into a society? You know, these endless debates, why some refugees don't want to be integrated. I just think that it's good to include also this element of enjoyment, enjoyment in the sense of regulating sexual mores and so on and so on. This is what really a way of, of life is. Not some abstract cultural values, but how you make love, how you laugh, how you treat authorities and so on and so on. And uh, uh, that's the core of a way of life. So when I said some ways of life are incompatible, I was accused of being a Western racist and so on and so on. No, I just claim that this is a real problem in the sense that uh, it's, what's my main point? Not we should impose some standards on others. No, 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 we should be here very open to dialogue and so on and so on. But my thesis, to put it in very abstract, even Hegelian terms, my thesis is that universality is not something above particular ways of life, in the sense that we have each our own way of life, but we are all universal. We love, but each of us loves in a different way, and so on. No, universality is something that corrodes from within every way of life. For example, fighting for universality does not mean impose our universality on others, and the same goes for ourselves. But fighting for the universality which is part of our own way of life as the critical energy which fights all that is particular reactionary in it. For example, for me, gay rights, abortion, and so on, it's universality fight in our culture. Women's rights and so on struggles in the far as they emerge in Arab countries are their own fight for universality. And here, uh, it's a very interesting point of how I learned from my Palestinian friends, even uh, Israeli government, IDF, the occupation of the West Bank, plays the same game as the British. They still have among Palestinians so-called honor killings. And the Israeli occupiers practically, whenever possible, ignore them, don't intervene. Because they got the British lesson that it's much better to dominate the West Bank, to have these traditional Palestinians with their honor killings and so on and so on. So what we should connect to on the West Bank is those, and they exist. I know them, wonderful rapper singers and so on, people, cultural groups, women, who are at the same time opposing Israeli occupation of the West Bank and their own traditional culture, claiming that they are ultimately on the same side. 
rejecting this idea that simple recourse to one's traditional identity is uh, enough to resist universal capitalism or whatever. Because, you know, the way we organize our enjoyment, it's a very ambiguous one. Let me give you an example, sorry for this brief detour, but I love it. Are you watching, now it's very popular, okay, now I do something for which I can be arrested. Uh, if you don't have it yet on your TV, go to Pirate Bay. You get it immediately. Uh, this new TV series based on uh, Margaret, Ed Margaret Edwards' classical novel, uh, Handmaid's Tale. Uh, I watched this series, it's not ever the full first year, but nonetheless, I watched it with pleasure, but then I caught myself enjoying it very much. And I was horrified. Why? Because then I asked my friends, and the same suspicion was con confirmed. I asked them, why do you like this series? Their official excuse was because it depicts the danger of uh, this uh, Christian fundamentalist society where women are not allowed even to read and blah, blah, blah. But then I dug a little bit deeper and discovered that it's not as simple as that. What we enjoy, we find a strange perverted pleasure to enjoy this universe, how women are controlled, all the details, how this works, and so on and so on. There is a strange pleasure with it. Or to give you another example, which is even crazier, uh, of this link between pleasure and guilt. I was shocked to read recently a report on a legal case in Mexico, and the title of this report, as it was reported in The Guardian, says it all, quote, Mexican man cleared in sexual assault of schoolgirl because he didn't enjoy it. And then I uh, emailed my Mexican friends and got the story. It's a wonderful one, wonderful in a terrifying sense. Uh, a group of three rich young men raped a young girl. One of them, the wealthiest, of course, from a family, was pardoned. Why? He, there was no debate about facts. It was all clear. But he, uh, the guy, his defense was not, I didn't do that. He admitted that he, sorry to be tasteless in details, that we played with, squeezed the girl's breasts. He penetrated her vagina with fingers, all that. But his defense was that he acted without carnal intent. He didn't sexually enjoy it. And the judge claimed this makes him innocent. Because if he didn't enjoy it, it was not a sexual assault. Of course, feminists explode that. Pro but what was, what was this judge thinking? My first idea was, I'm sorry if it appears problematic, but I mean it in a totally honest way. I'm totally against any rape. But if, if I were to have to choose a guy who rapes a girl in some kind of a blind passion, and a guy who does it, not even enjoying it, just in a cold way, sorry, but for me, the second thing is nonetheless minimally worse. Because, fuck it, why did he do it if he didn't enjoy it? Obviously, out of pure brutality, to humiliate her, to... He didn't even have the excuse of, I couldn't resist my passion or whatever. Obviously, the silent premise of the judge was, Experiencing pleasure as such makes us guilty, with quite a logical conclusion, if you didn't experience pleasure, you are not guilty. And I think this is uh, maybe part of our Christian legacy, and it goes even further. The first step is pleasure is guilty, but as every good psychoanalyst knows, you must bring this to the end. Not only Pleasure makes us guilty, but without guilt, there is no pleasure. And isn't this the, maybe, I simplify, the basic premise of Protestantism? You know, like, as we say, that was a common saying when I was young. In Catholicism and in Protestantism, you can do whatever you want. Just, in Catholicism, if you confess it at the end of the week, it's okay. In Protestantism, if you feel guilty when you are doing it, it's okay. And uh, 
you know, this is what I wanted to make clear with enjoyment. Yes, pleasure is pleasure, but guilt transforms simple enjoyment, sorry, simple pleasure to enjoyment. You take away guilt, pleasure is just a stupid physiological pleasure. And I'm so sad I don't have time here to go deeply into this crucial opposition between pleasure and enjoyment. Enjoyment would be pleasure generated by all the detours and so on in our approach to pleasure. Like, sex is not just, I see you, uh, uh, I jump on you, or whatever. Sex are all the detours of seduction and so on and so on. There is no direct sex. Let me quote you uh, an anecdote from my friend, the British Lacanian uh, uh, Darian leader. I used it in just one of my books, so it's safe to repeat it here, which I love it. He is a practicing analyst, and he told me he had a patient who, uh, who uh, reported to him one, how do you call it, slip of tongue, fellleistung, or what. He take a, a lady with whom he was flirting to a restaurant which was in the basement of a hotel. Of course, his dirty plan was a good dinner and then, oh, I'm tired, why don't, don't we go up for a room and so on. But you know what happened? When he entered the restaurant, instead of saying, a table for two, please, he said, a room for two, a bed for two, please. Now, here you see that Darian Leader is a good psychoanalyst. His reading was not the obvious one, which is, of course, he was already thinking at sex, at sex. No, it was the opposite one. He was afraid that he will enjoy too much the for, for pleasure, eating, and that this will make him forget why is he truly here to sleep with the lady. So it was kind of an ethical reminder. Don't get too much caught into eating. Remember, your true duty is up there later and so on. You know, this is why uh, uh, he was afraid in this sense of his enjoyment. Or another example, wonderful, of enjoyment, another friend informed me about it, who is now in the United States, now that they have still a crisis. My fr the friend of mine in the evening wanted, so he went into one of these big uh, Walmart megastores and noticed something very mysterious. Close to the exit of the store, there were many, how do you call it, those carts where you put what you want to buy, but still full there, full of stuff abandoned. And he asked a guy working for Walmart, what does this mean? And he told him something very tragic, almost beautiful. Impoverished middle classes who had this ordinary ritual of going to shop now cannot afford it. So they came there just to do the ritual. They walk around, put stuff in and so on, and they leave it there, they go. It's a wonderful example how they get enjoyment without pleasure. I don't have time to uh, show you another example which is the purest for me, and it's terrifying. I hope you saw it, not to, to be terrorized, not to enjoy it, uh, Joseph Goebbels' uh, Totaler Krieg uh, speech. Took it, you find it in 10 versions at YouTube and so on. And you know what's so surprising? He doesn't promise pleasure, it's just more suffering. Like Goebbels said in almost Kantian terms, do you want a war which will be so total that you cannot even imagine how total it will be? Do you want to suffer so much more that you cannot even imagine how much you will suffer? And it's a, this is really, in a terrifying sense, a great speech. Because there is no promise at the end, but at the end you will... No, he just promises more suffering. This is enjoyment reasons at its purest without pleasure. So, okay, uh, now uh, let me check it up because, okay, okay, what I will do is this, if you allow me to go a little bit over, I wanted before coming to the conclusion to do uh, another detour through 
Apocalypse hints me already that uh, how we end here, I wanted also to refer to my good friend Robert Faller, who is here, how this dimension of enjoyment beyond pleasure is as a rule embodied, enacted in all those blind, superfluous rituals and so on that accompany our acts of, as Robert Farrell developed this in detail in one of the most wonderful institutions that I imagine. This is the title of one of his books, Belief with no believer, with no bearer. You know, this was always for me the basic miracle of social life. How? There are beliefs which can function socially without anyone believing in the first person. Like, allow me to repeat, I hope you don't know it, another wonderful story that really happened in my country in the 70s, ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, there was enough toilet paper in the stores. But a rumor started to circulate that there will be a shortage of toilet paper. So, now comes the beauty. What happened? People, in contrast to what we usually assume, did not distrust powers. They accepted it that there is enough toilet paper. But they reasoned in this way. But what if there are some idiots who really think that there is not enough toilet paper, so, to make it sure that they have it, they will start to buy it like crazy, and there really will not be enough toilet paper. To prevent that, it's good for me now to go and buy a lot of toilet paper. So, you see the point? Nobody believed that there really is not enough toilet paper. It's enough to presuppose that there is another one who believes in it, and... Uh, at the end, the result is the same. I will not bore you here with the standard stories of, that I like to repeat of, uh, of this uh, belief of, of look, Santa Claus, you know, like, ask parents, do you believe in Santa Claus? They say, of course not, I'm not an idiot, I buy the presents. You ask children, do you believe in Santa Claus? Of course not, so why do you act as if, well, not to offend my, child, my parents and to get pre You know, like, there are numerous examples of this belief which functions socially, beliefs, without anyone in the first person believing in them. And we can go even a step further. Uh, now, because I know that Robert doesn't quite like Hegel, I will make a Hegelian twist on his theory and introduce here bestimmte negation. I will quote a joke, probably you know it, but I like to repeat it. One of the best jokes in Ninochka, Ernst Lubitsch's film, you know, a guy comes to a cafeteria and says, can I get coffee without cream, please? You know what's the answer? You must know he gets. Sorry, we don't have cream, so I cannot really give you co coffee without cream. <laughs> but we have milk, so I can give you coffee without milk. <laughs> you know, this is what Hegel meant with bestimmte negation. You know that, uh, although it's materially the same coffee, without. It's not the same coffee, it's without milk or without uh, cream. And from my youth, oh, those were paradise times, not really. Communism, I remember we had exactly the same joke. You, when something was missing, for example, that was the joke, socialist joke. You enter a store and ask, uh, do you already have or do you still not have, let's say, toilet paper? And you know what was the classic answer? Sorry, you are in the wrong store. We are, not the, we are the store which doesn't have oil. The store which doesn't have toilet paper, it's the one <laughs> across the street and so on. <laughs> so, uh, but now you will think it's just a cheap joke. No, I don't have time to go with it, and I hope, Robert, that for this, what we'll add now, I will be a little bit pardoned, not totally liquidated for Hegelian deviation. That I think that ideology mostly lies in this way today. It's not... Like, it, it give, brings you coffee without milk, and it claims that it brings you coffee without cream, as they put it. You know what I mean? Uh, it's the, it's the, the implied negation which is a false one. How does this work? Uh, uh, 
how does ideology function today? Well, I tried to develop it uh, when I wrote a text, not the one in Independent, but the one that I didn't get published. Nobody wants to publish it. It is too crazy about the French elections. I still think they are the lowest point of our so-called democracy. Why? Okay, we had Le Pen, we know what she is. Proto-fascist, whatever you want. Although I don't like this term, proto-fascist or fascist. Not that she is any better. Uh, the problem is that, don't you think that leftists are often quite lazy? They see something they don't like, and instead of thinking what is specifically new here, you simply apply the old term, fascism. You miss the point, I think. But okay, we have Le Pen, we know what she is, danger. Then, who is Macron? He is, it's clear, establishment at its purest. And when I just expressed some doubts in Macron, I was immediately accused of being a slave of fascism, of supporting fascism, and so on and so on. So do you see the absurd situation? How? Uh, Okay, I will repeat, you remember the Radio Erevan joke. Let's ask Radio Erevan. Is it true that in France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, independent outsider, united on all the people in a great anti-fascist struggle and so on? Again, in principle it's true, but A, he is not an outsider, but the very inside, and B, he stands, he embodies the very politics which produced Marine Le Pen. He stands for what gives space to <laughs> phenomena like, uh, like Le Pen. So, as a guy who hates me very much, he attacked me ferociously, a biographer of Michel Foucault, Didier Eribon. But he provided here a wonderful, he said, the choice is this one. If you vote for Marine Le Pen now, you vote for Marine Le Pen. If you vote for Macron, a vote for Macron is a vote for Marine Le Pen four years from now, in the future. That's all I meant, not that I am for Marine Le Pen, but this tragic closure, how, uh, and uh, so here, what does this tell of ideology today? Alain Badiou, at some point put it in a wonderful way when he wrote that the main function of ideological censorship today is not to crush actual resistance. Repressive apparatuses do that, but to crush hope. To immediately denounce every critical project as opening a path at the end of which there is something like uh, gulag. So uh, I think that that's the crucial thing that happened in France. You know, we had Marine Le Pen for what she is, and we had establishment at its purest. No actual alternative. And the paradox being, if you wanted to move more to the left, you were proclaimed an instrument of the right. That's what centrist liberals like to do today. They claim there is no longer a difference between left and right, just between liberal openness, which means global capitalism the way we have it today, and right-wing uh, right uh, populism. So I think that one of the great prospects, this makes me really sad, for Europe is that this standard politics will go on, the way it is, which brought us into trouble, just every four years we will be mobilized to vote for this politics in order to prevent the fascist danger, you know. And then, if you will move to the left, they will say, no, no, objectively you serve, you serve, uh, you serve fascism uh, and so on and so on. So we are in a very sad situation. I had another long part, but one has to, you know, at least from what I said now, you know what, uh, why people call me Fidel, not because of politics, but you know, comrades, five minutes and then five hours, no? <laughs> so I'm a little bit too long, I admit it. But now, if you ask me a more fundamental question, what can we do? What ethical attitude is the proper one today? When I say courage of hopelessness, I of course don't mean it we should just despair. I'm just saying that courage of hopelessness means not renounce hope, but get rid of the false solutions. Recognize 
a false solution which appears as a solution, but it's really a train moving towards you. That's the only way to really invent something new. Now I will do something quite surprising uh, for some of you. I will show you a clip, have patience, some five, seven minutes of a film, which I really like. It's from this new Danish noir series about a detective called Karl Merck. He designates himself as a terminally depressed de detective. And this is towards the end what you will see of the film uh, original title is Flasken Post, message Flasken Post, message in a bottle. But the title was very nicely changed in English, it a conspiracy of fate. Just so that you see the situation, not yet. Wait for half a minute of that. Uh, the situation is that in a, in a small hut close to the coast in a, the sea, there are four people. There is this detective, terminally depressed detective, uh, broken, uh, chained there. Uh, uh, and then there is the serial murderer called uh, Johannes. He holds in chain. Merck, inspector, as prisoner, and two kidnapped children, a boy and a girl. And Johannes is a pathological killer who presents himself as one of devil's son, whose task is to destroy faith. And he says to Merck, and now I will take away your faith. And I just, if it will work, should I maybe put this away? I don't know so that you will see more. Let us, please, now you can do it. Show this uh, clip. Ah, wait a minute. If you take it away, then I will take it this away. Thank you. Ah, we are here, yes. Please put voice. Nå tar vi en ting om gangen. Nå svarer du først på mitt spørsmål. Vet du hva jeg er? Nei. Jeg er djevelens sønn. Og jeg vet godt hvordan det høres ut. Nei, nei. Jeg vet godt hvordan det høres ut. Jeg tror ikke at jeg er djevelens eneste utvalgte sønn. For det er jeg ikke. Jeg er en av hans sønner, en av mange sønner. Vi er hans soldater, kan man si. Djevelens. Søytans. Så det er derfor du gør det her? Og så 
to the Bernie Inn. Far for them to him. For en del skil i helvede med det. Dette har ingenting med barn å gjøre. Jeg forstår at det kan virke sånn, men det har det ikke. Jeg har funnet den reneste måten å tjene hans endelige mål. Ferdig med det. Vi skal vinne over Gud. Jeg tar troen fra de som tror. Først fra et av barna, fra foreldrene, familien. Alle mister sin tro, og så sprer det seg. Og nå... Og nå... Nå skal jeg ta troen fra deg også. Jeg spiller din tid. Jeg tror ikke på Gud. Jeg tror ikke på en skid. Johannes. Johannes. Nej, 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 Jeg har aldri møtt noen menneske i hele mitt liv som tror så mye som deg. Johannes. Johannes. Det er bare en lille dreng. Han har ikke gjort noe. Ja. Ja, han er jo bare en liten gutt. Så hvorfor er det ingen som hjelper han? Tør meg i stedet for. Johannes, tør meg i stedet for. Johannes! Samuel, si det nå. Samuel! Nei, 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 nei. Johannes. Johannes! Johannes! Se meg! Skulle du ønske at Gud bilte deg med en sånn kraft at du kunne stoppe meg? Du kommer til å huske denne dagen, Karl. Få meg opp. Få meg opp. At du var her. Og at det ikke forandret noe. Og Gud kom aldri. Nå tar du denne. Hennes. Nå tar du hevn. Så blir du hans, så blir du fri. Find Karla Bjørn. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, I think that if there is again an ethical position which embodies what I try to render with my idea of courage of hopelessness, this is it. The beauty of this scene is for me not just that you see also a man who doesn't believe can be good. No, I'm more crazy. It's a radical atheist ethics in the sense of what I call atheist Christianity. In order to be really radical good or believer, but in this materialist sense, you have to survive the fact that there is no God, no guarantee, and so on. You have to go through this zero point. Of course, uh, it would be easy to read this scene in a cheap religious point and said, but it's not true that God is not here, but God was here two times when he wanted the detective, the press, to sacrifice himself and when the girl who is the sister of the drowned boy didn't want to take revenge. But my point again is what only very intelligent theologists even, some Protestants and so on, know that uh, like uh, ethics, again, not only is independent of belief in the sense of we can all be good. No, to be truly good, you have not to believe in this sense of believing in any higher authority that controls you, directs you, provides general uh, <laughs> guarantee. That's so difficult to accept for us. The 20th century Marxism was, I think, still part of this transcendent, almost religious ethics. You know, like history is on our side. We act with accordance of history. We get direction from history. Today, we have to act alone in this sense. There is no higher sense. There is no higher authority that will guarantee, provide meaning to our acts. There is no meaningful totality. It no longer works that classical teleology, which was still operative in traditional Marxism. You know that the most disgusting metaphor I can imagine for religion, the so-called big painting metaphor, that we, limited humans, are like idiots staring at a picture, which means reality, too close, and you see just stains. If you step back, you see that what appeared to you stains, creates, contributes to the harmony of the entire picture. In my reading, Atheist of Christianity, this is what dies on the cross. This idea of God as someone who, when you are in deep shit, you can say, but don't worry, there is a higher authority which provides guarantee. Well, tell this to Gulag prisoners or to Jews in Auschwitz. Don't worry, your Pain, uh, your suffering here is just a stain, step back and you will see how it contributes to the harmony of the universe. The proper Christian ethics is much more paradoxical. Is no, your unique suffering here, insignificant as it may appear from the abstract standpoint of some cosmic perspective, this is what absolutely matters, this absolute engagement. This paradox, to put it in theological terms, although we are obviously a small piece of dust in a small planet, as they say, on the outskirts of our universe, but nonetheless, in some existential sense, of course, not literally, but existentially, when you are in a difficult ethical predicament, your only experience is the whole world was created so that, for me, you know, everything will be decided. The fate of the universe in this fight here and now. And that's how I even read the radical notion of love. It's not love in this, this Buddhist love, you know, oh, all the universe, all the living beings. No, love is unique. That person, and I don't care if all the world false, disintegrates. That's why true love for me is not simply love for this on those reasons. It's 
There is an imp- you know, when you truly love someone, if you are asked, why do you love him, her? The only answer is, because I cannot do it without. It's impossible, simply, to step out, to leave behind. Love is not this cosmic Buddhist, all-embracing perspective. Love is a link to an absolute singularity. It's a total imbalance in the universe. So that would be, if you ask me, my existential perspective, the only hope given to us today. You have to be radically atheist. We are approaching deep shit, it's clear, at multiple levels. Uh, Ecological crisis, uh, 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 biogenetics, just name it. And I'm really provoked to provoke you, Peter. I can do it because, haha, only a leader will be able to ask questions. You will not be able to ask me. I even think that Protestant predestination means this. It is predestination in the sense of our fate is decided. But the secret premise of Protestantism is not, okay, if our fate is decided so, sorry to be vulgar, let's sit down, get drunk, drugs, and watch pornography, who cares? No, you have to fight all the time. You know why? Because we are predestined, but we never can know What is our destiny? And that's for me paradoxically the highest freedom. The highest freedom is to guess, which of course it means select, create your eternal destiny. No matter how limited we are in our practical choices, we can always choose our destiny, as it were. In, to put it in philosophical terms, trans- and that, that's uh, how we should react to today's crisis. We have a destiny. Pred- we are predestined. If things go the way they go, in 50 years, either it will be a total ecological social catastrophe, or in the best case, as Hollywood teaches us wisely, it will be in films like Hunger, Hunger Games and so on, it will be a new class society, those who are in, those who are out of the cupola. It will be worse than the old class society. This is our destiny. And the thing to do is to radically change the entire frame, to change destiny itself to change the entire perspective. That's why I think we should reject that uh, simple strategy, you know. What are the realistic options? Let's diminish pollution a little bit, you know, all this idea if, if uh, temperature raised for two, two degrees, it's still good. If for two and a half, it's bad. These are totally imaginary numbers, I claim. That's superstition. No, we have, as they say, to change more radically our own way of life. Now you will say, I'm dreaming. Listen, maybe I'm dreaming, but I'm not alone. Even intelligent conservatives know this. Read, please, the one who certainly is not a leftist Marxist, Peter Sloterdijk. In his book, Was Gescheint, Transing in Jahrhunderts, he paints very clearly this picture of unbridled capitalism and the nation state logic of the highest ethics as sacrificing for your state brings catastrophe. A radical change is needed and so on and so on. Everybody knows it, my God. Capitalism is changing into something new, we don't know what. And the horror why we are like the detective Merck is that, again, we cannot any longer rely on, on any safe Marxist teleology. You know, like, yeah, but progress or the digitalization, we will become whatever the stupidities are, singularity or a new brain and so on and so on. It's an open situation, we don't know where we are going. This is the wisdom of true revolutionaries. Robespierre and Saint-Just knew this exactly. Their metaphor was not we revolutionaries are developing some higher necessity. The most beautiful metaphor of Saint-Just was a revolutionary is like a navigator on a ship in the middle of a storm without a compass and so on. And even Lenin at the end of his life in some tragic moments, he wrote, we don't know at all what is happening, and so on. That's the only hope. I'm sorry if I was too long. That's nature. 
And I'm very extremely grateful for your patience. I know, like, I hope for a new renaissance of Vienna to flatter you at the end, but I mean it seriously. You know that a little bit over 100 years ago, your city was, as they say in Star Wars, the center of the known universe. <laughs> Name it. Science, uh, music, Schoenberg, all of them. I mean, Freud. You were it. You were it. And you know why? Adorno, precisely because you are not at the center of technological inventions and so on and so on, there was space for this. And I just hope that you will become that again. I'm sure that the official big cities, Paris, London, New York, they are lost. <laughs> it's trends with cities like yours here. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for that. Let me repeat my old joke. Don't waste your energy now. When we take over in different official conferences, you will be forced to applaud, you know. <laughs> Keep your energy for our dictators later. Okay. Now, jetzt Genosse Stalin wird in a kleinen resume mit kritischen Bemerkungen geben. <laughs> Slavo, thank you very much for no, I'm yeah, grateful to always, you, seriously. Always interesting lecture and to be with us. Um, I have here two pages of questions and I tried to... I hope you wrote the questions before knowing what I will talk about. <laughs> in a Stalinist way. You know. <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I choose uh, the questions after the, or the, during the lecture. And there was one uh, interesting question, question fitting in uh, the context of the film. Question that you also got from listeners. From listeners, yeah. yes. Yeah. But before the, the, the lecture sent by email. And this question, it's really true. It was, how did you sleep yesterday? I mean, I know you love the, the, the detective stories and we saw the, the film. So maybe it fits to the film. What is the point of this question? <laughs> I mean it in a naive way, but if you put it the way you put it, it would be like as if yesterday I raped five children and now how was I able to sleep the other night? No, I must tell you this, the same as you, as a heavy diabetic, whatever problems I have, they are not problems with sleep. I sleep more than well. The only problem, and I can confirm this, the truth of Freud's interpretation, sorry. Uh, I, I rather go to this, yes, okay. The, of Freud's reading of that famous Father, this do nicht, das ich verbrenne. You know, we don't just escape from traumatic situation into sleep and then dreams. What regularly happens, and it happens to be all the time, is that, okay, there is something unpleasant going on, you escape, you dream, but then, the big question that Freud asks, a very naive question is, why do you awaken in the dream? His answer is implicit, you sleep. But that, like, he uses this example. You know, we have so-called dreams which quickly incorporate an external disturbance so that you can continue to sleep, like the classic stupid things. It happened to me often, happens. Something is disturbing your sleep, let's say phone ringing. What you do is you quickly construct a dream in which a phone is ringing, so that you gain time. Now the big question is, but why do you then awaken? The standard primitive answer is that simply the external intrusion gets too strong. Like, you can, to be vulgar, go on sleeping, if I just say something, you can, but if I start to beat you, there will be a limit, no? <laughs> but Freud's answer is the opposite one. You escape from external dis uh, disturbance into a dream. But what you then encounter in a dream can be the trauma of your life. So you, in a dialectical sense, you awaken to be able to continue the dream, which is the dream of your daily life. Let's say you, are, uh, you did something horrible, you want to forget it. 
and you dream, but you awaken when in the dream you confront that trauma. So it's a beautiful idea, which is, I think, a correct one, not in this metaphysical romantic sense, our life is just a dream, but that our everyday reality is structured not as a dream, but as a repression, verleugnung, whatever, of something traumatic. So that will be my answer. I have no problem falling asleep. But unfortunately, I quite often awaken in, the problem is awakening. I awaken in nightmares, confronting different traumas, and so on and so on. So that would be the, the answer Very to good that answer. question. <laughs> so the, the second question, interesting question, but not so far away from your theories is, uh, do you think politics and comedy has something in common? Yes, but on one condition. My God, I didn't pay you for these questions. <laughs> because they are so, <laughs> till now, so easy and nice that, uh, you know what's crucial, if you permit me a brief improvisation here, The crucial thing is to learn, and I often develop this point, that comedy is not only the easy thing. When things get really horrible, then they are too horrible to do a tragedy out of them. The only thing you can do is a comedy. The idea came to me, I'm sorry if you know some of you, but this line of thought of mine. Uh, uh, I approached the question, why is it that all good films about Holocaust are comedies? Because again, it's too horrible. To, for example, let's imagine that you were to do a heroic tragedy. Uh, a Nazi torturer approaching a Jew, and a Jew says heroically, you can kill me but not break my spirit, opens his shirt or whatever. It underestimates the horror of concentration camp or a definitive You know, you are so b broken down that from, for an external view at least, it's a comedy. You know where also came this idea to me? Did you, uh, uh, did you see, uh, 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 no, did you read, I hope you did, Primo Levi, uh, uh, Sequestro e Nomo, This is a Man. And I discovered that some of the most horrifying scenes that he depicts are objectively comical scenes. Like, you know, when you had once a month or every two months in Auschwitz, so-called selectia in Polish, selection. All inmates had to run quickly in front of an SS doctor, just half a second, and she just put you into one of the two lists to be burned or to... And how it was a whole comedy to do it. The prisoners exchanged um, advices, how the point was to appear healthy. No? So how to pinch your skin to appear more lively red, how to, even if you are that tired and exhausted that you appear strong, it's a comedy. But it's even the worst of Auschwitz, the so-called Muslim and the Muslims, the living dead. The way they acted was like comic dolls, and that's the, it's not a comedy where you laugh, it's comedy at its most terrifying. That's, I wonder if you would agree, I'm sorry if I already developed some of my other talks here at this point. You saw the movie to which I'm opposed, although it fits my description of concentration camp comedy, Benigni, La Vita e Bella. I think the movie cheats because first, it's not comical enough at the very end when father sacrifices himself for the son and mocks as if they take me away, but he knows he will die. And when the son at the very end describes this, Uh, to his, I don't know who, uh, at that point, you are supposed even to cry, probably. I don't know. It's not, I think, that's why I'm telling you this. Where does the film cheat? How to make a truly desperate film? You know the story, I will be very brief. Father and son are captured in Italy as Jews sent to Auschwitz. There, father, in order to spare the son of the horror, tells to the son a story with a different spin. He said, we can live whenever we want. This is just one big competition for a prize. If you stay here, if you don't escape, then at the end we will get some big prize, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the tragedy is that allegedly the son doesn't suspect the truth and father in this way 
saves the son from too big a trauma. But imagine there would have been a way to make a movie much more horrible along the lines of the story that I said about Santa Claus. What if just before he is taken away to be shot, the father, Benini himself, were to learn that his son, he pretended to his son, this is just a comedy. His son knew the truth all the time, and he also pretended to believe his father, just not to make it too harsh for his father, and so on. That would have been what I would have called in Kierkegaard's term, infinite resignation, and so on. I think that the other horrible film with, uh, how is it called? Uh, 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 Pasqualino Sete Bellezze. Maybe you know it. It's another desperate, I think it's Liliana Cavani or Lina Wertmiller, Holocaust comedy. It's much better because at the end, when laughter stops, you don't get some sublime moment of crying. You just get total despair and so on and so on, you know. Sorry. As they say, you know, when I was young, we were still reading, now it's forgotten, Karl May Vinetu. And then the chief said at the end, how I have gesprochen. So, <laughs> ich habe gesprochen. So. <laughs> okay. Um, ja, die letzte Frage, um, uh, the last question, what do you think about Austrian politics at the moment? Uh, I, it's very difficult for me to talk about Austrian politics without laughing, but not for the reasons that you think. No, 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 you are wrong. You know that the name of your foreign minister, who will now even maybe be your prime minister, Kurz. In my Slovene language, this is an extremely vulgar term for penis. <laughs> Much worse than schwanz and so on. So when they say Kurz is coming to Ljubljana, everybody <laughs> dies laughing, you know. <laughs> and I think that in a way, in a way, uh, even uh, now that Kurz will visit Slovenia, The titles in Slovene was Kurz is looking at you. <laughs> and this sounds, because it's a Kurz Tegleda. When I'm tired of you, I say Kurz Tegleda, like let the prick look at you, which means fuck off, you know. <laughs> no, but I'm saying that although he's supposed to be intelligent, nice, well, maybe ultimately he is ein einfaches Kurz in Slovenisch, you know. <laughs> that he could have done much more precisely taking into account the unique Austrian position, even Kreisky, I think. As much as I don't like these Jewish decadent types, as per, but wasn't Bruno Kreisky, okay, he was Kanzler, but nonetheless, actually, he was much more, I think, intelligent in playing in knowing how to nonetheless play an international role with this unique, neither here nor there, Austrian uh, position. Like, your position enables you to do more, I claim. Your unique geopolitical position. But listen, if this is all you have, why don't we break all the rules of it's prohibited? I know it's horrible for old fascists like us. And allow at least symbolically one question from there, It's a good idea. One, so that then we can say, but the public also debated and so on, you know. Because I feel bad. Even the better thing would be to, this is deepest anti-feminist manipulation, to have a lady ask the question so that we can say, but no, ladies were also, the, you know. Sorry. Do you agree? Did That's I a good say idea. something yep. too much? Like, at least... One question, if you want to, because I really, all the jokes that I made, but like, maybe, maybe we shouldn't totally dominate the people. <laughs> Do you, does any of you, uh, yeah, sorry, you are. You can frage off of Deutsch stellen, wenn Sie wollen. Okay. Because the causes which will, yeah. In German we say, better, so es ist besser, ein Ende mit Schrecken, als ein Schrecken ohne Ende. In I, diesem Sinne yeah, wäre es nicht besser, man hätte, man hätte wie in den Vereinigten Staaten gleich Le Pen gewählt oder Trump, das ist geschehen, yeah. nicht? Und wir haben jetzt den Schrecken, aber das Ende. I 
I know what you are saying, and when I said, although I was misunderstood, that I prefer Trump, I was attacked for the same reason. My thing would have, yeah, you know what I hoped? No, in France, I didn't support Le Pen because I think she is more dangerous with all the openly fascist tradition than Trump. But listen, I think still basically I was right. My logic was this one. First, and we can see it clearly now, no, Trump is a confused guy, he is not a fascist and so on. My, he is evil, dangerous. My point was this one about uh, Trump. Only a kind of a shock, which hopefully will not be too dangerous, can awaken the American left. I hoped for a more dynamic faced with the trauma of Trump's victory in the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, it's horror what is now happening, and as some of my leftist friends, like Colin West said, it's not uh, the problem of the United States now, it's not even primarily Trump, it's the catastrophic reaction to him of Democratic Party. They were first horrified, Trump, the end of the world. Now Democratic Party is radically renormalizing Trump. Nancy Pelosi said recently, uh, don't be afraid, Trump is like Reagan or Bush after four or eight years will be back and the Democratic Party establishment is now using all its energy not to really fight Trump but to throw out the Bernie Sanders danger. So I still, you know, it's not an a priori statement. I'm not this old-fashioned crazy Marxist like communists in Germany, 33, Besser Hitler, the, the lines would be clear. It's a very strategic statement. I'm just afraid, as I said, that we are entering a new cycle. Isn't this a very sad prospect? But what you said, I deeply appreciate that logic because do you remember, I think I found a wonderful example, even with my limited knowledge of German, I remember some 20 years ago, was it, when Against call, the candidate was Hans-Jochen Vogel. And I know enough of vulgar German that I know verkohlt means verbrennt with call, no? And verfögelt means we know what. And one of the leftist motto was a nice lady saying, better verfögelt als verkohlt, you know? <laughs> I like it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what I'm, so, I'm saying to, no, I'm not so crazy. I'm well aware of dangers. I just, I'm desperate. I know all the risks. And again, in France, Le Pen is not innocent. We are witnessing uh, entering now a terrible new era, not so much France, not even new Austria, but some of post-communist East European countries, my own Croatia, Hungary, up to a point Poland, Baltic countries. A new narrative is emerging, which is terrifying, which is not only rehabilitation, no rehabilitation, denial, whatever, of Holocaust, but the idea is this one, to cut a long story short. The uh, Holocaust was organized by Jews. How and why? Jews wanted to dominate Europe, to ruin Christianity, and in a cold calculation, they knew that Germany is the only hard moment defending Europe. French are degenerate and British are in their island, so Germany has to be broken. They consciously provoked Hitler to do the Holocaust, so that now Germany is uh, just in this regressive mood, non-aggressive, uh, uh, accepting refugees. Now come with the second point. The claim is there is no Arab-Israeli conflict. It's just a mask to blind us. The Arab invasion, refugees of Europe, is a Jewish plot to ruin Europe. Why I'm telling you this? Not to shock you, but for one reason. Isn't this sad? And Trump is part of the same movement. This uh, regression decadence of public speech. Such rumors were circulating all the time. But till five years ago, maybe ten, 
They were a private obscenity. You talk like this if you're crazy with your friends at a Gaststätte or where. Now they more and more penetrate the public speech. I think this is a catastrophe. So that's how the title of the book is meant, not the final countdown, will we be swallowed by refugees? No. I think we should be more proud, but in the right way as Europeans. European legacy of enlightenment and so on, it's a great legacy. The true threat to it are not refugees, our own defenders of Europe are the true threat to it. Imagine Europe when Le Pen is a president in France and so on. That would no longer have been Europe. Whatever maybe if there is, is still worth fighting for in Europe. But again, to calm you down, I'm not totally crazy in just engaging in provocations. I'm just deeply afraid. If just this type of conflicts would get repeated, Macron Macron, Le Pen, Macron, Le Pen, then at a certain point, Le Pen will win. We have to change the field. That's my only point. Thank you, Slavoj, very much. Ich danke Ihnen. Danke. Und, as I like to say in my provocative style, using very problematic terms, wir sollen immer einsatzbereit sein, in unser Kampf für Freiheit. Und, uh, I like to use the term Einsatzbereit in a different way. Thank you very much. I was proud to be here. jetzt die Möglichkeit, noch Bücher ähm, unterschrieben zu bekommen von Slavoj Žižek. Ja. Genau.